All right, welcome. We are here today for Carlis Vina's presentation on Love Our Languages, Elevating the Languages of Those We Serve. Um, and Carly will begin right now. Thank you very much for being here, Carly. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited uh, to share a little bit about this idea of loving our languages and really encouraging and nurturing uh, our systems so that everybody in our community really embraces and elevates the languages of those that we serve. So very, very excited uh, for our time together. So if you are catching the recording, very glad that you are here. Um, I do have a bit.ly link for you. So uh, at any point you can pause the video and you're gonna be able to uh, update or find that uh, link with all of the resources that we're gonna be talking through today. But before we hop in with our content, I wanna share a little bit about who I am and the lenses that I have as I enter different spaces. So I'm an educator through and through um, I was an EL teacher for many years. I was a third grade bilingual classroom teacher in an English-Spanish transitional program. I was also a dual language teacher, a multilingual instructional coach for eight schools in the Chicago suburbs from pre-K through eighth grade uh, and loved every minute of that. I am currently serving at a nonprofit in Illinois uh, full time and uh, I do a lot of support for uh, schools and districts across the state and beyond uh, who are really passionate about supporting our ML students. So um, I love, love, love. That is, again, my biggest passion uh, in, in my work, really fighting for equity for our students and families. Um, I'm also a mama. Uh, I've got a son who's in high school. Uh, and it's really interesting. Did y'all know you don't have to like have parental approval before signing up for driver's ed? No, you could just like sign yourself up. So that's fun. <laughs> I've never taught anyone how to drive before. So if y'all have that experience, please like leave all your tips and tricks because <laughs> I'm hungry for them. Uh, I also have a daughter who's in fifth grade. So we're not quite there yet with the driving, but we are very much in like the arguing about the hoodies stage of life because, you know, here in Chicago, and I know y'all too, like we get cold winters, right? And we really, it's really, really important for fifth graders to like, no one should ever know that we own a winter coat, right? Like a hoodie is sufficient. Uh, so we do a lot of that at home. Uh, <laughs> I also foster puppies and sometimes people will say, oh, Carly, that means you're a nice person. Not quite, because I do it purely for selfish reasons. <laughs> being in education is very hard. Uh, being a mama is very hard. And at the end of the day, sometimes you just want to snuggle with something that doesn't argue with you about hoodies or do a pop and observation unannounced. So puppies it is. <laughs> um, I'm also a, uh, a sister. I've got my two sisters here in this photo. This is often the photo that I'll share if I do a publication for somebody and they'll say like, oh, we need a, a headshot. Uh, this is often the photo that I'll send and then they'll say like, hey, you know, this isn't professional. And I say, why? <laughs> why not? This is how I show up in spaces. Uh, even if people would like me to turn her down a little bit, I cannot. <laughs> this is who I am through and through. I'm also the author of the book, Moving Beyond for Multilingual Learners. So while this is going to be a shorter session, um, I would invite you uh, for this time together today. Um, you ever go through like, you know, in, in winter, we get all this like gunk on our windshields. Uh, and I feel like every winter, like I'll go through weeks and weeks and weeks where I'll have the uh, wiper fluid low like image on my dashboard because I just go through so much of it. But you know that moment when you have so much gunk on your windshield and you finally are able to like use the fluid and clear off your windshield and how much brighter and clearer everything is. Sometimes I feel like when we get into spaces or moments where we can all come together and share a message and share some time and some ideas and some brainstorming together, I want this to be a time, a moment, an opportunity for all of us to just clear our windshields because when we can see our goals in front of us, right? When we can see the students in front of us, like this is why we're here, right? We're, we're here, we're watching this recording because we have such fire in our hearts for the students and families that we serve. So I hope that today's session can help you to uh, clean your windshield today. 
I did mention we do have that resource document. Uh, and as we go through some of these tools and ideas and resources today, I would just invite you to just choose maybe one or maybe two that will work for you. All of our schools and districts and communities are a little bit different, right? Uh, and so we have different needs. Um, some of our colleagues are really excited to partner with us and serve as allies to us and our kids. Um, and others, we need a little bit more support, right? And bringing them along in this work. Work. Um, so again, choose one or two that might work for you in your setting. Um, also, please feel free to take screenshots. I'm totally fine with that. Um, but I am going to just move my screen over a little bit just so you can see um, that doc that I linked uh, in that bit.ly. So all of my uh, contact information is at the top. I find that helpful because I'm like, I love attending webinars and professional learning sessions. Uh, and sometimes I get lost in like all the ideas and like, the tools and the links and all of it. And I'm like, wait, who was that? <laughs> I want to have a question. I have a follow-up question. So um, I did link all of that contact information up there. So all of the links that we're going to talk about are here in this tool or in this uh, resource document. Uh, so it is there for you. So I'm going to move back over now to our, uh, our slideshow over here. Um, I also would invite you, if you're a digital note taker, you can absolutely use that document just to capture all of your thoughts and ideas. Just simply go to file and make a copy, uh, and that way you can just use it as a digital note taker as well. So the purpose of this work of loving our languages and elevating our languages, this is everybody's job. Right? This is everybody in the school ecosystem's job. It's not just the EL teacher's job. So our students and our families, unfortunately, combat linguistic oppression inside and outside of school every single day. And that's really uncomfortable to talk about, but it is really important that we spend some time unpacking this because it is a reality. So we need to build an awareness, number one, kind of have to start there, uh, just an awareness of our space's linguistic abilities. We need to support our colleagues in ways that they can maximize language opportunities. And we can also model respect and appreciation for all languages. So y'all, I don't know if y'all have seen this. This is a, a resource that Sesame Street published uh, in 2022. So this isn't an old thing. This is like a brand new resource. So we know our friends at Sesame Street, right? That organization is really big on providing tools and resources and materials for our youngest kids. Think early childhood, right? Three and four year olds and their families and caregivers, right? So they have the TV show. They've got all these different resources online, right? Cookie Monsters on Twitter, right? These are our buddies that we, many of us grew up with. But just last year, they had to create a resource to support families in having conversations with their young children about navigating language oppression in their communities. So y'all, this breaks my heart that they even had to publish this, um, but they did because the need is so great. So this book is called Spanish is My Superpower. And in this story, Rosita, who's one of the characters, she is sharing a story with her friends, with Big Bird and Elmo and all her buddies, uh, about a time where she and her mother went to the supermarket, just in the community. And they were playing an I Spy game, similar to an I Spy game in English. It's called Bayo Bayo, right? I see, I see. And while they were playing this game together as they shopped through the market, they were approached by somebody, I can't remember if they worked in the store or if it was another customer in the store, but they leaned over while this child and her mother were playing and they said, excuse me, we don't speak Spanish here. We speak English here. Hmm. And so in the story, uh, as Rosita is telling her friends this, you know, all of her friends are getting fired up and Elmo's like, that's not fair. And Big Bird's like, that's not right. And Rosita is sharing, you know, it really, it was a scary thing that happened and it made me feel worried. It made me feel sad. And so she's able to name all of these feelings. 
And then she goes on to share what her mother then said to her. And she, her mother was trying to like, you know, inspire her and encourage her and, and see their language as a superpower, right? But the fact again, that Sesame Street had to publish this set of materials for our youngest children, for our three-year-olds and four-year-olds, so that they can have tools to cope when these situations occur at the supermarket. Doesn't that just break your heart, y'all? Oh, so you can find these, like these are uh, available for, for purchase. I think I got my copy on Amazon. They come in English and Spanish. Um, it's a great, it's a great resource. They did a really nice job, but it just makes me so sad that this even has to be a tool that we share with families. So I first started to hear about this idea of linguistic oppression from Dr. Jose Medina. If you're not following him, make sure you are. He's all over Twitter, TikTok, Instagram. He's the coolest. He's a lot of fun. Um, but he really, he, he gives us a lot of tools and ideas and pushes our, our thinking a little bit in terms of linguistic oppression, because sometimes it's really obvious. Like when we're at the supermarket and somebody says something like this to Rosita and her mom while they're playing a game, that's pretty blatant. But we also have moments throughout the school that happen all the time that we might not be as easily able to recognize as an oppressive practice for our multilingual students. So I have a question for y'all. So how many of our schools say that they value diversity? Right? I think that's something that a lot of our schools like to say nowadays. Um, they'll even put it like in their mission statement. They'll put it on their school letterhead. It's on their website, on their social media, right? Like we value it. Yay, it's so great. Um, but I also want to follow that up with how many schools, like inside the school, like if we're walking down the hallway of the school, how many of your schools have something like a diversity corner? And what by this, I mean like that spot in the building where they're like, oh, we're gonna celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month, or we're gonna highlight, um, I don't know, we're gonna highlight this for Black History. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it's just in one section of the building, right? And my follow-up to that follow-up is, why is it always outside the EL teacher's classroom? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? That's the only place in the building, nine times out of 10, that have languages other than English on the walls. So when we go back to those statements of like, we value diversity, how? How do we value it? How, where's the evidence, right? That all of us value our linguistic diversity, our racial diversity, our religious diversity, socioeconomic diversity, all of it, right? Um, and so it's important to kind of think about, right? So there is something um, that this is, a, this is an activity that you can do with your staff, that you can do with your students. There's a lot of different ways you might play this activity out in your setting. And this is a reflection of our own language journey. Sometimes I'm talking to folks and they'll say like, oh, what do you do in education? I'm like, oh, well, I'm an EL teacher, right? I support English learners or multilingual students. And they'll say, whoa, what languages do you speak, Carly? And I'm like, well, actually, you, know, you don't have to speak any other languages to do my work, right? Um, but people are always like, oh, you must be, you must speak seven languages. No, I actually don't. <laughs> I wish I did. That'd be cool. Um, but this idea of a language journey helps us as practitioners, as educators, reflect on how language has, uh, you know, been shaped over our lives. And so if I were to reflect on my own language journey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back into time, right? I'm gonna think about growing up in the city of Chicago. I'm gonna think about walking down the block and hearing Tagalog and Russian and Polish and Italian and Spanish and all these different languages. But I grew up in a monolingual English home. Uh, I didn't have any other literacy skills besides English. My family, my parents did not have any other literacy skills or oracy skills in any other language. Then as I started to uh, hear the languages of my friends, my teammates, my neighbors, right? I started to see like, wow, there's so much out there. I wanna know all these languages too. I got the chance to learn an additional language, but I wanna note, this is a difference. This is important to note. I learned an additional language out of privilege, not out of a necessity or a need to survive or navigate a life, 
Okay, so my additional language I learned out of privilege. That's important for me to recognize. So I learned Spanish out of privilege when I attended high school and I continued learning it in college. And then when I started to move into education, I received my ESL endorsement. While I was uh, teaching in that setting, I was able to utilize Spanish to support students and families. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. And eventually I went and took a test so that I could be a bilingual teacher. And I had to take a Spanish proficiency test in order to do that. Uh, so while I was teaching uh, in a bilingual program, we were uh, like an, a 70-30 transition model for third grade at the time. And so I was doing a whole lot of literacy in Spanish. I started dreaming in Spanish. I hosted all of my family events in Spanish. So my Spanish skills were really, really good. And then when I moved uh, into a, a coaching role, I was still using Spanish some of the time, but I tell you what, still today, my Spanish is a constant fluctuation. Um, and as a reader, um, I love reading, but I really like reading like those fluffy like romance books, like kind of like a Hallmark movie where there's like always a happy ending. It's kind of predictable, but you still enjoy it. That's kind of my gym. But I've been pushing myself as a reader to try to read more biographies and more nonfiction. But y'all, it takes me twice as long, if not longer, to get through those types of books because the, the structure of the genre is so different, right? There's a lot more facts and dates and names and places, right? All these things. I finally had a friend say to me, Carly, read the young adult biographies that might be a little bit easier for you to get through and I was like oh as a writer in English I, I wrote a book and so sometimes we were like oh writing's easy for you I'm like well not quite um I have a colleague from New Jersey who asked me Carly do you want to do a professional study with me and I said no that's not really my thing like my writing style is very narrative and I just kind of like conversational kind of low-key informal but writing a research paper and conducting all these like that intimidated me uh and I did it I pushed myself we pushed ourselves out of our comfort zone but boy that really was uncomfortable for me as an experience as a writer so again if I did that idea that reflection of my language journey who I am as a languager and what has shaped my language journey I'm going back in a time I'm thinking about my family I'm thinking about my neighborhood I'm thinking about my schooling I'm thinking about work I'm thinking of all the different ways that I language in my life right these types of conversations are important for us to have as practitioners because these things don't come up in conversation often. Like when we're at the copier with a colleague, we don't say like, tell me about your language journey. We don't do that, right? Uh, so this is an important piece. This would be a great way to launch like a staff meeting, just like just have that individual time to reflect and maybe jot down a few notes and capture a few ideas and then go ahead and turn and talk and share with a partner a little bit about like some pieces of your language journey, who you are as a language or how you have grown up languaging, even if it is a monolingual language journey. When we do this type of activity, especially with our colleagues who don't have like, you know, they don't, they're not the multilingual teacher, they're not the EL teacher, we can start to open their eyes just a little bit about languaging, right? Because sometimes they'll say to us, oh, I'm not the EL teacher. I'm not the language teacher. Guess what, friend? You are the EL teacher. <laughs> you teach language all the time, right? As you teach science, as you teach PE, as you teach visual arts. So now I'm going to scroll back over here to that note-taking document on that bit.ly that I linked. Now, if you wanted to do this for your students, there are several templates for you to try out and they're all linked here. Um, so I have them set up in kind of different like age level chunks. So if we were to look at these, uh, the EC through grade four. So if you teach early childhood uh, up through fourth grade, this is a slideshow. Uh, so again, if you like this and you say, hey, I want to take this, but I want to tweak it a little bit. You simply go to file, make a copy, make it better, make it fit your scenario. But I do have a quick note on the beginning of each of these slides. So you can see if you click on the intermediate one or the secondary one, uh, ways that you might use this. Uh, but this is great for students because they can reflect on their languaging, right? When they're saying, I'm reflecting as myself as a listener. If I'm a second grader, I can listen in Korean when I am maybe with my grandpa or maybe when I'm watching television or maybe when I'm listening to music with my brother, right? I want to tell into how students are languaging 
through the listening domain uh, in their heritage language. Uh, this again, speaking, reading, writing. So in each of the slides, I just gave a few examples just to kind of generate some thinking, but you can remove those if you want, uh, but you can keep them there as a scaffold. Uh, I also have uh, students reflect on their language powers. I have language powers that can help me. I have language powers that can help others. And my language is important to me because, right? Engaging in these conversations with our students is so, so important. If I click ahead up over to the nine through 12 grade level example, uh, it does give us a few other like the same kind of template, right? I can listen in this language, like uh, Tagalog when I'm doing this. I can listen in Mongolian when I'm doing this. I can listen in English when I'm doing this, right? So it gives us a moment just to call attention to that. Um, what do my language skills help me to do? Uh, what do my languages connect me to? Why is my language important to me? How can my language skills serve others? These people have impacted my language journey. So again, maybe they're talking about family members, caregivers, educators, right? Uh, siblings, friends. They might, instead of being able to identify people specifically, they might instead have moments that have impacted their language journey. Right. I can think back to when I was learning uh, Spanish as an additional language, I was very uh, embarrassed. And so I told my teacher in front of my whole Spanish class, estoy muy embarazada. Uh, and my, my Spanish teacher was like, no, 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 I promise you you're not. And I said, no, 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 I promise you I am. And so we had to have a, a quick talk about false cognates because embarazada of course means pregnant, uh, which I was not, I was very embarrassed, uh, which led to more embarrassment, which was great. Um, and then as I continue on my own unique language journey, a few goals I have for myself. So this might be a goal that they have for maintaining their heritage language, or continuing along their English language journey. So those templates are there for you to check out. Again, those are there in that bit.ly link that was shared earlier. But again, this would be a great thing to do with staff. This would be a great thing to do with students. This would be a great thing to do at the classroom level with every kid, even if they're multilingual, monolingual, whoever they are. Uh, this is also a cool thing to do if you ever have like stakeholder groups for like strategic planning, or if you're on a committee like at the public library, like this would be a really cool moment too, just to start some initial conversations and reflections uh, with folks in our community. Sometimes we hear the phrase, language barrier. Have y'all heard that? Um, and, I, and I understand what folks are trying to communicate when they say that. But honestly, when I hear it, I get a little bit itchy um, because languages themselves are not barriers. They are blessings. <laughs> languages are blessings. Uh, they connect us to our identity, right? Uh, they are not something to overcome, but rather to embrace. They are tied to our identities. They are tied to our cultures. They are tied to um, uh, the way that we grew up, right? They are tied to a lot of things that we do every single day. So let's talk about certain things that we can do to start elevating, number one, like building awareness, but also elevating the status of languages other than English in our spaces. So around the new year, I started to see a lot of different folks sharing their like Spotify playlist. And I think it was called like year in review or something like that. And it was kind of set up in a graphic like this. And it was like, you know, kind of like a concert, like a music festival type of setting. Uh, and it gave a, a title of like, you know, Music Fest for Carly Spina, if it was my playlist, right? And it would have all these different artists, music artists that I listen to a lot. Um, but I was like, yeah, you know what? This would be a really cool thing if we took this template and instead like changed it out a little bit, you know, but instead showed off and bragged about how many languages we have in our schools. So in that note-taking document, there is a link to a template where you can design this. But if you go on Canva or really any other uh, template generator sites, uh, you'd be able to do this pretty quickly. But this would be a great thing to put in school newsletters, to brag about on social media, to post on large posters all around the school, right? This would be a really cool thing to brag on. So when we talk about this idea of a campaign, and I call it a campaign because that's exactly what it is. You're, you're bringing folks along. You want people to join a movement with you in your school and in your community. So I call it hashtag love our languages. So step one, step one is really, really simple. Uh, and if I click over to that note-taking document, I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna click that love our languages part one. 
And it gives you a link to my blog where I kind of outline how I did this, how I rolled this out. Um, and I also was able to collaborate with Clara Baz Bowler on Twitter. She was wonderful as a collaborator. Um, and so I got really kind of frustrated, honestly, with some of my colleagues, some of my coworkers, because they didn't even know some of the students in our classrooms had an additional language. And I was like, oh, what can we do to just build some understandings here? So just some general awareness. And so what we did was this. We had conversations. I printed out a template and I popped it in every teacher's mailbox. And I made it real, real simple. And it was just here. This is the one I sent them. If you click on that link, it'll, it'll show you. So it gives you like a little bit of like a description. So it was like a little mini packet almost like, hey, we're a district. You know, ABC, we're proud of our diversity. We always say that, right? Uh, please have a conversation with your classroom about how many languages are spoken by either the students or their families or their caregivers or guardians, right? Uh, and then write them out on the attached template. If they're online, if like if you have a, a school that's really active online, you can tell them to hashtag love our languages, right? But this is the template, it's super simple. The teacher's name goes here and in this room we have how many languages? And then an example. So here in Mrs. Spina's class, we've got 10 languages and then we, we wrote them all out. So it was really, really cool, really simple. But then what do we do when we're done with that? When we're done with that, I've got this poster here. Now I don't wanna put it inside of my classroom. I wanna put it outside my classroom door. And here's why. If it lives inside my space, that's cool. But I wanna brag about it. I want everyone who's walking through the school to see that I am bragging about our linguistic abilities in this space, right? Even if the students themselves don't have that language skill, their family does. And that counts, right? That's a part of our identities. So I want to post that outside the classroom door. When I do that, it also, again, kind of builds some buzz around it because now kids are hanging out from other classrooms outside the door and they're looking to see what languages we have. It's really, really cool when we can do that and when we're bragging about um, our, our students. So you might say, well, Carly, that's not really an authentic activity, right? It feels a little bit like force. And you know what I say to that? Maybe. It might not be, depending on how we set it up, right? I gave teachers full freedom too. If you wanna just do this for five minutes and have a five minute conversation, great, do it for five minutes. I've had teachers though extended over like a whole period, like a whole class period. So this is again, up to each teacher to kind of design how they wanted to do this. Um, so it might feel inauthentic, but like when they're doing it, but we want to kind of start somewhere and build out, right? So step two, now what? Now I've got all these posters outside of the door, right? And if I'm walking down the fifth grade hallway, now I see all these posters or these, these uh, images, right? These graphics, so like now what? So step two is incorporation. It helps us move beyond just acknowledging our languages and saying, okay, now what? Now what can we do? So uh, in that note-taking document, there's a few pieces, and I'm gonna scroll this out just a little bit. Uh, so part two is there for you. Um, I did find, if you follow Michelle Shorey and Dr. Irina McGrath on Twitter, um, if you're not following them, make sure you, should, you follow them. Uh, their uh, Twitter handles are linked there for you. Uh, their website is fantastic. Um, I linked their website there for you. Uh, but I first learned about a translation tool. It's powered by Google Translate. So is it perfect? Absolutely not but it gives us a starting point. Um, there is a list of available languages there. So you can see if, you know, how, how uh, many languages uh, you have represented. But if you take a look at the big one that I linked for you, uh, this is what it looks like. And when you click on it, it'll tell you view only. Uh, so you'll just go to file, make a copy. And when you do that, you can rename it, give it your own name. So I'm gonna give it a minute to just kind of load. When I do that, it takes about a minute or two to load because all the cells are pre-programmed. So here's what I do with this tool now. So now if I am a fourth grade teacher and we're looking at our next science unit and we're gonna be talking about the planets, maybe I'm gonna type in all of our content specific pieces of vocabulary, okay? And I'm gonna link them all here. 
And as I do that, I don't know if y'all noticed, it was translating across all of these different rows. Isn't that amazing? It's a beautiful thing. Um, so again, it's not a perfect tool by any means, because of course we know that in some, uh, some words, like if we're talking about the math word product, right? That could mean a lot of different things in English, but the teachers will see this tool as magic. The kids will also see this tool as magic. Um, the nice thing about this big one is I did this for a school district that I was working with. Um, if you don't see your language that you need, check along the bottom. There's a whole lot of tabs there that you might be able to find your uh, the language that you need. But of course, all the languages that are available are linked for you. There are instructions on their website. So if I go back over here, and I click uh, the translation tool. If I go onto their website, they'll even show you a video of how to program uh, the uh, doc so that you can uh, make rows for your language that you need or make columns. Um, but there's a lot of different things now we can do with this. Again, content-specific vocabulary, boom, it's all done. Now teachers can take this tool, they can screenshot it and post it on Seesaw, Schoology, Google Classroom, whatever their digital platform is, or they can uh, like take their screenshot and blow it up and posterize it. And now they have a multilingual word wall in their classroom. How cool is that? Maybe they make a real big one and they use the grade level specific vocabulary and they pop it in the hallway so that everybody in seventh grade now sees all of our content specific vocabulary represented in multiple languages. Now we're getting languages on the walls of our spaces and that's really powerful, right? What you also could do with this is, um, you know how like we do family newsletters? I spent so much time y'all doing like big long blurbs like paragraphs of what we're doing like in science this week da, 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 da. and i would have a whole paragraph for science and a whole paragraph for math and a whole paragraph for social studies um i didn't realize how much stuff was in there and i tell you what as a mom i have two kids i don't always read those and that's so bad right carly you're a teacher you're supposed to read i don't have time i'm sorry i don't know if that makes me a bad parent or what or an uninvolved parent or what but i don't always read them if we were to take the content vocabulary that we're going to be working on, and if I am a family who maybe they have Ukrainian literacy skills, but not English literacy skills yet, if I like have this attached in the newsletter, I'm not, not be able to access everything that you're saying here. But if I see these words listed out, I'm now I know. Now I have an insight to what y'all are going to be talking about in class next week. And that gives me an in. So there's a lot of potential just with that one tool alone. Isn't that amazing? Just one quick tool. So I'm going to come back over to our uh, PowerPoint here. So that is step two, right? We wanna start having conversations about incorporating heritage language into the space. And then the step three is kind of outwards, the community. So anytime we had a family event, we had these lining the hallways, right? The kids were so proud of their languages represented. This one was uh, taken outside of the uh, library, the school library. And she did, she just kept a running tab of all the different languages uh, across a week, I think. So three grade levels across a week. Uh, and she was able to collect all of these. And so she posted it outside. I have to tell you, I was volunteering as a uh, translator, a language liaison at one of my buildings, and um, I was just observing, uh, and I was there to, you know, see if I could help direct any families, you know, to where they were needed to go, and it was really, really cool because I was able to see there was a, a father and a son, they were walking out of the classroom, and he stops, and he sees the sign, and he's looking for it, he's like, oh, good, you said Lithuanian. I'm so proud that you mentioned our language here. And I was like, oh my gosh, that was such a cool moment. But it got better. It got cooler because they kept walking down the hallway. And then all of a sudden the dad just dead stops. Center of the hallway, dead stops. And he starts pointing at the wall, the poster of a different classroom. And he's like, wait, 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 wait. And he talks to his kid. Who in here speaks Lithuanian? The kid's like, I don't know, dad. That's a fifth grade classroom. I'm in fourth grade. He's like, no, no, no. You got to find out. Oh my goodness. I can't believe somebody else in this community speaks Lithuanian. Should we go in and talk to the teacher? And the kid's like, no, dad, let's go. Right. So embarrassed uh, that his dad's so excited. But it was a cool moment to witness this dad feel connected with somebody in the community. Right. Another cool thing that happened from this is that my students, my bilingual students started to get really, really in tune with who is multilingual in our school, in our setting, in our, our community. And so anytime we have like a guest speaker or a guest author or any type of visitor like that, they would always say, 
like, you know, like, oh, what questions do you have for me about my job? And my kids would always be like, uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, do you speak another language? Do you have any other languages that you can read in or write in? Or can you listen in another language? And nine times out of 10, they would say, oh, no, I can't. And they would, and my kids would say, oh, that's okay. No one's perfect. But if you could speak another language, which one would help you in your job? And it was a really cool conversation. We always had like those uh, police officer, like uh, police friendly, friendly police, uh, officer friendly. That's what I'm trying to say. Officer friendly would come and, and give us like, you know, a little rundown. So my kids started following up. We sent emails to him all the time. Like, hey, do you have a canine? Uh, I saw that on TV that some police departments use dogs. Do you have one? Can you bring it in? Can we pet it? <laughs> uh, you know, hard hitting questions like that. Um, but they always tied in something about languages. So there was a moment where my classroom got an email from this officer and I pulled it up on the screen right away. I was like, oh, y'all, like, Officer Joel, you just sent us an email. They're like, what does it say? And normally you're supposed to preview stuff beforehand. I didn't that day. Um, but he's like, hey, Mrs. Spina's class, so excited, so proud of y'all. You guys inspired us for our holiday video. And I'm like, what do you, you know, wait a minute. What is this about? And the kids are leaning in like, what do you mean, Officer Joel, right? And he says, we here at this police department, we polled everybody. We wanted to find out how many languages we have in our department. And so we asked everybody, we asked the dispatch, we asked the janitorial staff, we asked the beat cops, we asked the detectives, we asked everybody in the unit, right, of, of the department, uh, how many languages. And we have 31 languages. And so we are gonna post this later, but we wanted to show it to y'all first because y'all were the inspiration for this. This is our holiday video. And so I clicked play and y'all, I cannot even tell you, I was bawling, I was crying so hard because in the video, they all said happy holidays in 31 different languages, including sign language. And it was so cool for the eight and nine-year-olds in front of me to see this and see that they were the inspiration. You know, normally we see different roles like that in the community. We say like, oh, they're the hero. They're the inspiration. No, these eight and nine-year-olds were the heroes. They were the inspiration. So it was such a cool moment uh, for my students uh, to be a part of and, and check that out. I'll also share and just reiterate, right? Language access is a right, it's not a privilege. Uh, how accessible is language support? So if you are doing any type of event uh, and you have uh, folks on your staff who are multilingual and can provide language support, brag about it, get big old buttons, right? Here's an example here. You can buy these on Amazon or other retailers, right? That says, hablo español. If you are a Spanish speaker and you can communicate in that language, brag about it, make it real big and noticeable. If you have to wear a lanyard, right, we all do, um, post that somewhere so that folks can see that you have a language skill. Number one, you're really cool. And number two, you can also provide support uh, to families as they're coming in, right? So that's just one small thing. And then wear it all the time because that's something to brag about. That's cool. So we need to ensure all of us, the bus drivers, the front office, our administrators, our librarians, everybody in the school, not just the EL teachers. We need to ensure that the languages of our communities are visible and audible within the walls of our learning spaces. And it's important for us to keep these conversations alive, keep them going. When you see something happening in a school, like in a, a classroom, brag about it. Go to that teacher and tell them, I love the way that you talked about this cognate. I love the way that you have this poster displayed. I love how you played music in this additional language. Keep those conversations alive. Keep them fresh. Keep them at the forefront of what we do. And my final thoughts uh, for us and for our time together today, trust your kids. Trust your kids. Love them hard. Celebrate them. Lift them up. Lift up their families. They need you and friends. We need each other in this work. So let's continue these conversations. Let's continue loving our languages, elevating the languages of those that we serve, and let's empower each other in the process. You can find me on Twitter at Mrs. Spina's class. Uh, you can email me anytime. I'd love to hear your ideas, your thoughts. And then again, check out that uh, bit.ly link. There's a whole lot of other uh, related tools uh, that you can check out um, on that uh, resource document as well. But friends, thank you so much. Uh, and again, let's keep those conversations alive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carly. That was a wonderful presentation. And 
I, I really liked your point about learning, for many of us, learning a language is a privilege, not a necessity. And it's, it's wonderful to see the diversity and the, the, the wealth of languages that we have all around us and we may not know. Is, did I see, is there a, um, a code at the beginning of your presentation where they, a QR code that people can use to access yeah. the, the bit.ly? Okay, yes. yep. great. Because that's a really wonderful resource that I think many of our members would love to use. Excellent. Excellent. Right. Um, well, thank you. We very much appreciate your being here. And um, yeah, we, this was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And um, we hope to, we hope you will come back sometime. <laughs> and I will ask, I will ask our membership to email you if they have any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Carly. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.